Hey everyone, how's it going? Okay. Starting here in just a few minutes, as soon as 12.30 hits. I'm sure most people are finishing up their lunch. And over. We're learning. Good to see you all yesterday. Nice. I got to see most of you guys in the uh, lab. Cole and Bailey are together. Yes, indeed. Have you fried? I think your next session's online, so I guess we're pretty much done after this, if you want to be. Hey there. Friday indeed. Hope you guys have a good weekend plan, something safe and fun. Was having a fall festival nearby, and I was like, mm, about that? Fall festivals are fun, but during COVID times, who knows? Kelly? Um, you know, I guess it depends on what you're studying. If you're taking like a mixology course or, you know, uh, if you're in bartending school, perhaps that would be fun. But, uh, or maybe if you're studying to become a sommelier, perhaps that would be fun. But, uh, for PA school, I don't know. That's going to be a very subjective opinion, I think. They're earning daily. Of course, if you have questions, post them up on the sticky board or um, on the chat, and we'll start with our derm topic. So really, we got derm, and then oncology, and then you're done with farm one, which is pretty cool. No, I think you guys are done with Clint Patha, right? So you guys are kind of wrapping up the semester pretty quick here before you know it. Oh, one more clean path exam. Sorry, I didn't mean to get your hopes up. But close, close enough. Better than uh, being two exams away. Say. Uh, unfortunately, gives you more opportunities to to show your your education. Uh, interesting. Yeah, uh, Matt. I'll talk about that a little bit later. I should be able to get to it. Oh yeah, it stings me like you think you're all done and then you got one more test. Well, you definitely only have one more test for me, at least this semester, and then four more next month. I think I talk about permethrin in this uh in this lecture here. Get down to No, maybe not. Um yeah, so I guess I can probably talk about it elsewhere. He was acting up this morning. That's no good. Sorry to hear that. But it is 1230. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so let's look at the sticky board here. Uh, so I missed a few questions uh, when uh, I was on the wrong board last time. So quite embarrassing on my part. But that's okay. Um, so someone was saying, how does Zilutin cause a flu-like syndrome? Really any uh, protein-based product has the possibility of causing sort of a, a light immune, immunologic reaction, right? So you can see that um, 
just like if you were to get a flu shot, you can have a mild reaction to that, you know, um, so kind of the same process there. Your body's just having a mild reaction to the proteins, causing an inflammatory reaction to get some aches and pains and all of that, but it's generally pretty mild, pretty self-limited for the most part, right? Uh, someone's saying, how can uh, Zolair or Omalizumab cause cancer? Um, and so basically with that one, because you are inhibiting IgE, right, because that's an antibody against that directly, um, you know, the full mechanism may not be known specifically, but some of it probably has to do with, um, you know, if you have like a cancerous cell develop and, you know, it's been shown to be sort of an aberrant sort of cell, you know, your body can mount an immune reaction against that and get rid of the cell to make sure it doesn't replicate. But if you were sort of selectively suppressing certain parts of the immune system, there is a risk you could have a secondary malignancy. So it's not a super common thing, but it's one thing they've at least noticed an association with. And again, we don't use Zolaire for like a first line drug. We're typically saving it for people who are uncontrolled on basically everything else there. So uh, someone brought up another interesting point here. They said, you said leukotriene modifiers have relatively benign side effects, but doesn't Montelukast have a black box warning for neuropsychiatric events? First off, I don't appreciate your tone that I'm inferring with uh, no knowledge of what your actual tone meant to be. I'm just kidding. Uh, that's fine. So uh, actually, I didn't know about this. I wanted to look it up to see if that person was correct. So I pulled it up. And here is LexiComp. And what do you know? March 2020. This is actually pretty recent in the grand scheme of things. Um, looking at after review of available information, FDA is requiring addition of a boxed warning. So if you ever hear about a black box warning, if you're looking at the top here in LexiComp, this is the first thing they always put up is if the drug has a black box warning. And so we'll talk about a few other drugs today that also have that. But Talking about uh, Montelukast has to strengthen an existing warning about the risk of neuropsychiatric events, e.g. serious behavior and mood-related changes, including suicidal thoughts or action. And so it says you can go find further information from the FDA because they're the people that set all this stuff up. And so I went said, let's go check that out too. Um, and so basically this talks about what um, they're doing here. And so, um, you know, you can find further information uh, going through this, you can find out specifically why they thought that uh, this should be included. So, for instance, they reviewed case reports submitted through an observational and uh, conducted an observational study using data from the FDA Sentinel system. Right, it was one of those things where maybe they don't know true cause and effect, but they notice a, a, an association. Right, and again, post marketing review of things like adverse events and whatnot is so important. Because again, if you do clinical trials, you're only giving it to thousands of people potentially. We don't know what can happen if you give it to millions and millions, right? And you find those one in a million side effects if you only give it to millions of people. So anyway, so they were looking through here and basically finding there was an association. Um, and again, this may be a good thing to consider. I'll probably put this in my slides moving forward, but certainly something you'd want to know about uh, if you had a patient with a history perhaps of um, you know, depression or anything like that, this could potentially exacerbate that. In my experience, I've seen um, quite a few children get Montelukast. I mean, it's a pretty standard drug for most kids with asthma getting admitted to the hospital. They're going to be on this in a lot of cases. Um, and I've not heard nor seen any cases uh, where this has been an issue. So again, that's anecdotal. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It's just I haven't seen it. So probably why I didn't even really think about it very much. But because it's a box warning, that's why the FDA did that. That's why they went ahead and said, hey, be on the lookout for this stuff, you know, because a lot of people didn't think about it either, right? So very interesting point. Thank you for bringing that up. I, I appreciate um, you expanding my knowledge a bit there. So anywho, let us get back into the PowerPoint. Let's talk. start talking about DERM uh, here. I'm sure some of you may have a, a burgeoning interest in uh, the DERM world. Uh, just in all fairness, I am... Not an expert in all things. Um, obviously, YouTube streaming, I am, I would consider myself a novice, if anything. Um, but certainly not all areas of medicine am I an expert either. And so derm is one of those things where I just don't have a, as much uh, hands-on experience so much as I do with other things. Like, you know, for emergency medicine, asthma, um, toxicology, I can talk about that stuff for hours and hours and hours because I've either had experience with it or I've seen it, done a lot with it. Derm is just one of those areas where I just don't have a lot of experience. So I can at least talk to these things, talk about how we use these drugs on a uh, pretty um, you know, normal basis here. But if you want to get in the weeds on some of these things, I'm probably going to get out of my depth fairly quickly. Um, so that being said, 
If you have further questions, I may not be able to answer them all, but we can certainly find someone who does. Like, for instance, we have some really great Durham uh, preceptors that can really help us out. Some of them actually come in and do lectures for us. I think, is Professor Sales doing your Durham lectures? I think she took over that. Um, but regardless, you know, uh, you know, people who do this day in and day out, they may have different answers to things than, um, than I might have, right? I can kind of speak to the medication specifically, but if you're talking about how would you use it in this type of patient for, versus that type of patient, I may not be able to, to talk about that. Um, Professor Sales is not a Durham PA, but sometimes we have guest lecturers that come in. Um, so Miss Blair, I think, I don't know, Amber Blair, I think is her name. She's done some lectures for us before. I don't know if she's coming in this time, but she's really good if you get her as a preceptor. Um, that being said, though, I don't know if any of you guys have met uh, Harish from the 2021 class, but he is actually a dermatologist uh, and, and coming over to the U.S. to get a degree as a PA. Uh, and he had uh, startlingly few corrections for me, which is fantastic. So either indicating he is much more polite than I already thought he was or um, I was getting things correct. So who's to say? But hopefully he would have corrected me if I said something truly egregious, but no corrections, which is good. So anyway, um, he is probably one of the nicest people you'll ever meet in your entire life. So good guy. Um, anyway, so getting into uh, talking about medications uh, used for dermatology. So I want to talk a, a little bit about the kinetics first to kind of discuss um, how we're using these medications, how use differs when using topically on the skin versus something you may see used uh, more systemically. And not to say that you don't use any systemic meds for dermatology, because we do, and we'll look at a few examples of those. Um, so in general, what we're gonna find is that uh, a lot of differences in terms of uh, kinetics, because we have this skin we have to get through, right? And we know that not all skin is created equal. If you find skin on the face, it will react differently with medications and skin, say on the trunk or in the axilla or on your soles of your feet even, for instance. Um, and so because of that, that can really affect drug penetration pretty significantly. Typically, the thinner the skin, the more drug penetration you're going to have. When we talk about uh, drugs used for, uh, uh, when we talk about androgenic drugs used in male patients to boost testosterone levels, um, typically we actually apply it as like a topical lotion or gel actually to the testicles, right? You can actually apply it to the scrotum because uh, that has very thin skin and it can absorb it very easily, for instance, versus other areas may be less permeable to the medication. And again, if you recall when we talked about this in um, pharmacodynamics, if you recall that fixed law, that's going to come into place here when talking about how drug transfers over. And again, sometimes this is a good thing because we want the effects uh, systemically. Sometimes we don't. That can actually be a bad thing. I'll give you a really good example of that in just a little bit. So anyway, so some ways we can do that. So if we can apply drugs to thinner skin, you get better transfer. Thicker skin, you're going to get less transfer, which makes sense. Concentration gradient. By increasing the concentration, you also will get better penetration and increased drug transfer, right? So for instance, if you're using um, topical hydrocortisone, which is a steroid, right, corticosteroid, um, you can get better effects by increasing the concentration. There's other things you can do too, and we'll get into that. But again, more drug means more transfer because the concentration gradient from outside to inside is larger there, right? We're gonna find that in terms of dosing schedule, um, the skin can be really helpful because it can provide um, sort of a nice depot for drug to collect and it can serve as a reservoir. So if you ever hear this depot effect, that's basically you think about like, you know, the Home Depot is just a big warehouse full of a bunch of home stuff, right? It's a depot for home goods. Um, if you think about the skin with medications, you can kind of do the same thing. And so it allows for short acting medications to be given over a long period of time as the skin sort of absorbs it and slowly leaches it into the systemic circulation. So if you ever see someone with say, for instance, a fentanyl patch or a clonidine patch, um, those are medications that can be given every few days, three days, seven days, depending on the drug, and it will slowly be absorbed through the skin. And even if you took the patch off, they still will have some drug effect because the skin has that reservoir capability there, right? Um, talking about vehicles and occlusion, right? Vehicles, I'm not talking about the car that you drove to get to lecture today. That's a much funnier joke if uh, you actually had to drive to a class anymore, but instead you just had, probably had to step over your dog or something. But um, I said the joke was never funny to begin with. But uh, so vehicles talking about what is the drug itself actually put in? Is it in a lotion? Is it in a gel? Is it in an aerosol? What sort of vehicle is it being uh, placed in to be then transferred over to the skin? 
And then the other term here is called occlusion, or basically what's the staying power for that, that vehicle? Like how long does it stick on the skin? Is it wash off very easily or does it like to stick around? We'll talk about some examples of that. The differences here is you can find that drug permeability can differ greatly depending on the vehicle that we put it in. When we talk about water content versus oil content, things like that, that can make a big difference depending on drug solubility. We can find that some of these vehicles are better at moistening or drying the skin. And so this is one of those caveats that you'll hear uh, novices at Derm, and I'm sure people who've worked in Derm offices or people who will go on to do it will probably uh, cringe when I say this, but a general caveat for Derm stuff is if it's wet, dry it, and if it's dry, wet it, right? Uh, again, that's kind of a painting with a broad brush there, but you kind of get the point um, that you can utilize different vehicles in order to get different effects, which we'll talk about later. Um, and even the vehicle itself may be therapeutic, right? It can be moisturizing, it can provide um, relief, uh, it can provide occlusion, things like that can be beneficial in and of itself. And then also occlusion can actually increase toxicity in some cases, and I'll give you an example of that in just a little bit. So some other considerations too is that the drug solubility in the vehicle. If the drug is not soluble in the vehicle, then it's not gonna go into solution, it's not gonna transfer through the skin very easily. That's one thing. The other one too is the ability for the vehicle to hydrate that stratum corneum. The better it's able to hydrate, especially if it feels like really dry and scaly beforehand, um, it's that, that inhibits absorption. So by making it more uh, moist and making it more hydrated, you get better penetration. And then the last thing a lot of people don't think about is the stability of the drug in the vehicle. You know, things like microbes, they love to grow in water, right? And so if you have a drug that is in a more highly water-based vehicle, um, you have to worry about stability. So that's why we have to have things like, um, things like preservatives and things like that to try to prevent microbes from growing and making the product non-sterile anymore, right? Um, most of those products aren't really strictly sterile, but they at least don't have a bunch of bugs growing in them. Uh, and so from that standpoint too, we have to consider like, you know, well, what, you know, if the patient, if you give them a topical drug and all of a sudden they have a rash that breaks out, well, was it from the medication that they got? Was it from the vehicle that the drug was in? Was it from some of the adjuvants or some of the other things like stabilizers and um, uh, preservatives and things like that that are also in that product that the patient could be having a reaction to, right? Those are all considerations there. This is again, a, a very, um, loose sort of uh, list here in terms of things that are going to be more drying versus least drying. And what we're going to find is, is that at the top here, you typically are going to find things that are either have a higher water content or actually have a, a decent alcohol content. Alcohol in products is very drying because if you imagine if you spray down a, a table surface with isopropyl alcohol, ethanol and isopropyl alcohol, they all evaporate very quickly. And so that tends to take some water with it and can be quite drying, okay? Maybe beneficial in some cases, maybe not in others. Um, and then as you go down, you're gonna see you know, fairly high water contents, but then you're gonna see as you get further and further down, you're gonna have higher and higher uh, oil-based contents. And oil-based contents are gonna be le less drying because they have better occlusion, they stick on the skin better. So if anyone has, um, for instance, ever put on like a lotion versus something like petroleum jelly or Vaseline or something, you get much different feels from that if you were to rub it between your fingers. Also, one of them washes off much easier with water versus the other. The other oil-based one sticks around for longer. So again, all of those can make a difference in terms of which one you might select for your particular patient. Sometimes you don't get a lot of choices, but for some of them you have like a lot. So do you want ointment? Do you want a cream? Do you want a lotion? Depends on where you're applying it, depends on what kind of skin you're dealing with, all of that. So for the more drying things, you'd want to use this for things that typically are more moist and maybe you're having vesiculations and crusting and things like that versus for drier lesions and whatnot, you'd want um, something that can be uh, more moisturizing. And so that's kind of a general rule of thumb there. Again, there's probably some exceptions. Uh, here's a table that kind of looks at some comparisons between these, and I just want to illustrate some of the points here. Um, so we have across the top here, we've got creams, ointments, gel, foams, and then lotions, solutions, and, and foams as well. So kind of uh, some differences here. Now, if you are aware of emulsions, if you remember what that means, it's basically when you have two immiscible substances and you mix together, right? Um, and so we can have, depending on the concentration of the thing, you can either have an oil and water emulsion, which is going to be more water-based, or water in oil emulsion, which is more oil-based. And you can kind of see that here if you're looking at the percentages of waters in these different things, uh, or percentage of water in these different products here. 
And so let's look at some of the uh, advantages and perhaps some of the disadvantages of these products here. So for instance, with a cream, which is an oil and water emulsion, it does leave some degree of concentration of drug behind on the skin. So even though the cream itself uh, may have some degree of evaporation or drying, it does leave a little bit of drug around. However, though, something like an ointment actually has a protective oil film on the skin that maybe prevents things like, you know, dust and things like that, irritating it. You can keep uh, the drug on there for longer um, versus like a gel or foam. It's nice because it doesn't stain anything. It's greaseless. So it feels, um, you know, you don't have, to have that icky kind of greasy feeling after it washes off. Um, it would be good depending on the patient. Looking at advantages, um, you know, creams and ointments, they tend to spread pretty easily. But if you can imagine putting an ointment in your hair, on your scalp, that would not be great because now your hair is going to be all looking like, I don't know, something about Mary. That's probably too late of a reference for you guys. But, you know, something like that where the hair is looking kind of goofy because they have this ointment that's holding everything in place. That wouldn't be really good versus like gels and foams might be better for more, um, you know, applications like the scalp, for instance. Right. Um, looking at lo locations, we're going to see here that ointments, you want to be careful in intertriginous areas. So places like the, the uh, groin, the axilla. Any place where you have a lot of like thin skin, especially if it tends to be like occluded like your armpit is, um, that issue with that is because the products are so occlusive and they stick around for longer, you can get increased penetration of the product. And so that may lead to toxicity depending on the type of drug we're dealing with. So we'll look at that later. And then disadvantages. Notice here the higher water content, you're going to need things like preservatives to keep bugs from growing. Versus on the disadvantage of an ointment, it's kind of greasy feeling, can stain clothes, things like that, which is not great. You know, typically patients like things that don't have that greasy feel to them, but it may be advantageous to go with it depending on the situation. And again, higher occlusion with something like an ointment there. Okay. So point being is not to memorize every single fact, but some of you, if you've ever dealt with a lotion or a cream or an ointment, you might have a general feel for these things. And that will kind of lead you to intuitively make sense of like, okay, well, if I want something to stick around for longer, I probably want it to be more oil based and it'll be more occlusive and it'll stick around. And maybe I want to avoid it in those, um, you know, intertritious areas, more, more thin skin, things like that. Anyway, so that's basically the gist of it for the pharmacokinetics. Let's move into the specific topics here. So let's talk about acne First of all, um, you know, we know this is a multifactorial disease. There's a lot of issues here. Uh, could be, uh, you know, genetic in nature. It can have environmental factors playing a role here. But we're going to see there's kind of four main pathogenic steps or four factors that we're mainly going to be focusing on with our medications. And again, this is going to be another um, disease state where we can try to focus on synergy between different drugs with different mechanisms to be able to target these separate factors. So one of which, and I'll show you some pictures here, include um, what that, this looks like. But first off, it's increased sebum production in the follicles, say on the face, for instance. Once that kind of starts to clog things up a little bit, you develop this keratinization, this hyperproliferation of the ductal epidermis. Okay, so you have this proliferation, you're starting to get this extra skin starting to grow there, and then we have the bacterial colonization. These first two steps are going to lead to sort of a blockage of the follicle, leading to um, uh, basically a, an anaerobic environment where stuff like propionum bacterium is able to grow sort of unchecked. So you get this bacterial colonization and then your body doesn't like bacterial colonization, says it wants to fight that off. And so now you have an inflammatory reaction and now you have a giant, you know, zit on your face basically. Um, and so we can look at different things to try to target this, uh, these different factors here to help out treating acne. Now, looking at some other contributory factors here, some of which you can try to change if the patient is amenable to it. So if they can do certain non-pharmacologic steps here, that's always going to be helpful. Um, so for instance, if they can get out of certain uh, environments, like if it's not super hot and humid, but you know, if you live in Florida, we don't have a whole lot to do with that. Um, but you know, if they're playing sports and there's a lot of pressure or friction on things like, you know, where their helmets or their shoulder pads are, that can lead to some issues. Um, you know, some patients who are uh, treated for acne just uh, overdo it with the excessive scrubbing and washing, which can further irritate the skin, which can end up leading to actually worsen um, effects, you know, things like that. Um, and certainly physiologically speaking, you know, being stressed, uh, it makes sense why that might actually worsen acne in some cases here. So for instance, you know, if you're chronically stressed because you got like three tests coming up the next week or you have an OSCE on Monday, for instance, um, you know, you're stressed out. So your body's releasing more corticosteroids like cortisol. Um, what does that do for your body's ability to fight off that inflammation or to fight off that bacterial colonization? Well, not a lot. Right? It's going to inhibit that, if anything. So you can, uh, that's why you can see some people, they break out when they're really stressed, as the case may be, right? So 
again, as I mentioned, the pooling of the sebum creates that anaerobic environment. So that's already going to kind of clue you into what kind of drugs we might be using here, which will make sense in a little bit. Um, and we can see they get that proliferation of propionium bacterium acnes. This is the main one we're going to be focusing on in terms of uh, the bugs to treat. Uh, again, you're going to get the inflammation process happening here. You're going to have the T cells responding. You're going to have lipase and different things like that start to hydrolyze triglycerides into fatty acids, and that's leading to that keratinization process there. And then overall, the cytokines and inflammatory cells are eating up those bacterium, spitting them out, and now you're generating this pus um, in the comedone itself. And again, some of this may be more or less inflammatory depending on the pathogenesis for that particular patient there. So you can kind of see in this picture here, what's going on, you have a normal follicle, you get that abnormal keratinization, and then now you have the microcomodone being formed here. Again, as the sebum production goes up, you're getting that more sort of um, uh, occluded you know, area where you're getting more anaerobic conditions, bacteria is growing, and eventually things can continue progressing um, into whole nodules, cysts, pustules, all that fun stuff, which again, that's why I go into pharmacies. I don't have to deal with a lot of that stuff as it turns out, which is nice. Um, Anyway, so I like this picture a little bit better because it's kind of showing the different pathogenic steps here where, again, you have the follicle, you have the sebaceous gland, which is going to be increasing in production. This is going to be a big step we can target with our medications here. And again, you see the bacterium starting to just start to, to grow and proliferate, starting to see the inflammation kick in, and eventually all these immune cells coming in here. You have this nice, really red, angry, hot feeling sort of um, uh, cyst uh, that, you know, uh, you know, maybe pop, maybe not, but, you know, you want to get rid of that. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on their medications here. So um, another thing I like to point out, too, when we go through these different topics, is not only just like people who naturally develop acne, but I like to mention as well um, when drugs can induce some of these problems, too, right? Because you don't want a patient to come in who is complaining of acne, and then you don't really address the underlying cause, right? So if it's something like a medication that they're on, and they don't have to be on that medication, then really you're just treating side effects. And to treat a side effect by adding on more drugs, so adding drugs to treat the effects of drugs, is not great practice. So the ideal thing would be if you can get rid of the inciting event, especially if it's a medication, that's, that would be good. That may not always be the case, as you're going to see here with some of the medications. So, uh, for instance, like with systemic corticosteroids, it makes sense why that can actually lead to acne. Um, again, some of it is due to its testosterone-like effects. Um, some of it may be related to a lot of it with the anti-inflammatory effects and all of that. What's actually interesting is that um, you know, you'll see this with more chronic use of the drugs here, um, less so with hydrocortisone, but more things like prednisone and, and dexamethasone and whatnot. What's actually interesting here is that you can um, you know, try to remove the drug and you think, okay, this is going to fix the patient's acne. Uh, but actually removing it leads to an initial worsening because all of a sudden your immune system is starting to kick back in and it starts to fight off all those um, different um, cysts and nodules and whatnot. And then you actually see increased inflammation as, as the immune system starts waking up again. Um, so again, they think they're getting worse, even though they will eventually get better there. But things like anti-epileptics, tuberculostatics, even lithium can all affect this. And again, if you have a patient with a seizure disorder and they're on a medication that really works to manage their seizures, but they have this acne to go along with it, again, it's a risk versus benefit sort of thing there. So it really just depends on the patient and what they've tried, what, um, what works for them. All right, so our goal is going to be, did I get a haircut? No, I did not get a haircut, I don't think. Thank you for the question, though. Um, I try to get as few haircuts as possible. I've had one in the past uh, since March. So, anyway, um, so looking at this uh, in terms of treatment, we know this is going to be a chronic disease. It's going to require early and aggressive treatment, and you'll see this kind of goes through peaks and valleys in terms of uh, intensity of treatment. If you're having an exacerbation, you beef up your treatment. And once they go back into remission to a degree, you can go back to more low key maintenance therapy. Um, because again, we're going to see that the treatment itself is certainly not without its side effects. Um, a lot of the things we're going to be using here tend to be pretty irritating to the skin. So yeah, they may look a little bit better in terms of the actual lesions being uh, diminished, um, but their skin may be like irritated. They may have like flaking that's happening here. Um, so there are certain drawbacks we want at least want to be uh, cognizant of. And if we can go scale it back to as low-key therapy as possible, that's going to help and limit the side effects. So, And then if we can slow down progression of signs and symptoms and limit duration and recurrence, all that good stuff, that would be fantastic. Obviously, this is a big one here in terms of like preventing long-term disfigurement, especially for more severe acne cases and then um, any psychological suffering. If we can ameliorate that, that would be fantastic for your patient too. So our target here is a microcomedone. This is what we're going to be focusing on in terms of uh, if we can prevent that from occurring, that's going to really help to stop a lot of the um, other downstream pathologic steps here. 
And we can see that we want to focus on both farm and non-pharmacologic therapy, right? So again, just because in farm class doesn't mean we always have to use drugs. And if we can use target multiple mechanisms, right? Look for our synergies where they're uh, where they make sense, and then target multiple steps if we can, right? Typically, for more mild to moderate therapy, stick with topical, right? Um, remember though that with topical treatment, it's only going to work where you put it. So if a patient has acne that's affecting the face, the shoulders, the back, and I only put stuff on the face, it may work there, but it's not going to work anywhere else. So for more diffuse disease or more moderate to severe cases, that's where systemic therapy will come into play. So we're going to kind of talk, um, starting off with like the really the wimpiest drugs out of the bunch, and then kind of work up to the the big guns, right? Uh, and see how that sort of they compare to one another. So in terms of cleansing, um, what you tend to find is that uh, using soaps and things like that, they're basically just surfactant systems. Um, they disperse and remove fats and oils from the skin, right? So just like when you um, cut up some jalapenos or something like that, you want to make sure you soap and water to get rid of the capsaicin from your fingers because they're very fat soluble. So by using a surfactant system uh, like dish soap, you can then wash those away, right? Um, same thing happens for the skin as well. And so again, those fats and oils are good because they keep the face hydrated. However, um, they can also lead to that uh, occlusion of the follicles and lead to the, the acne from developing. So we have to balance between being clean and also the drying, irritating effects of soaps. Soaps tend to not be the great best products because once they're rinsed off, there's really nothing left of an active ingredient to do anything. And also what's interesting is that the high pH of soaps, which is um, soaps just by their nature are high pH, higher than seven, um, they tend to degrade the activity of some other agents. So that's gonna be something too we wanna look at is the timing of our medications to make sure we're not gonna inactivate one by using another. So typically we recommend not washing more, uh, not more than twice a day, more frequently than that, especially if they're using like really um, harsh soaps or if they're using like exfoliative uh, scrubs and things like that, they tend to be much more irritating. Try to keep it twice a day and not uh, completely scratch up your face like crazy. There's a cartoon that's kind of funny about some girl had to zit. She started playing with it and all of a sudden her face is like completely scratched up and she's like, oh, that's so much better. That's not what we want here, right? So anyway, so as I mentioned, topical therapy only works where it's going to be applied. So this is not may not be the best thing for really like diffuse disease. And again, most of these are going to cause skin irritation. This may lead to patients discontinuing early because they feel worse than they did with just the acne by itself. And so to help to mitigate that, we want to try using lower strength products and then gradually increase. And then again, for exacerbations, you bump it up using more aggressive therapy. And then as they get back and get into more of a remission type of state, that's where you can use more lower strength products to help mitigate some of these irritations. And then using non-alcoholic products is also handy because of the fact that um, the alcohol itself can be quite drying. So this helps to, to limit that. So you can see here where our different products are going to be working along the different pathogenic steps of acne. So we'll start, we'll talk about all of these, but you can kind of go back and review, review these to see where they're working. And I'll talk about these individually as we get to them. All right, let's start off with the basics here, benzoyl peroxide. Now, remember, a lot of your patients have probably already tried this before coming in. Most people, before they go and try to see a provider about their acne, they've probably tried over-the-counter stuff. And so that's why history is so important. And asking, you know, why or you know why are you here today what's going on what have you tried already what's made it worse what's made it better etc so this is why um you have to ask that kind of stuff because otherwise if you give them something they've already had then they're probably not going to think you're all that good of a provider they're like i already tried this why am i going to try it again i already know it doesn't work right so someone had a question up on the board here um they said uh so a systemic steroid can make acne worse i thought steroids reduce inflammation which is what acne is Right, it kind of cuts both ways a little bit, right? Um, again, if you are having a system-wide anti-inflammatory response, um, now all of a sudden your immune system is not fighting off those bacteria, so they're able to sit there and just kind of uh, fester and continue to grow. Um, so again, it seems odd because you're like, well, I'm cutting down the immune system, so I'm getting this inflammatory response. Let's take away the uh, the drugs, the corticosteroids, and now all of a sudden it gets worse. Because now they now you have that inflammatory response. So again, it's a balance between these two here. And again, some people are more susceptible than others. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, let me know. 
All right. So benzoyl peroxide, what we're doing here is that it's actually going to penetrate down into the stratum corneum uh, and then it gets converted over into strictly benzoic acid. And this does have pretty good activity against P. acnes. Okay. Remember the nice benefit about using topical therapy as well is that you have really limited systemic side effects. Most things are just relegated to the face or the skin that you apply it to. Um, again, start off with something low dose and, you know, see how they respond to it. it may take a few weeks, right? So start off like two and a half percent one day, once daily, and then you can try to increase strength and frequency if they're tolerating it, right? Um, this is available over the counter. So as I mentioned, most people have probably tried this to some degree before they come and see you. And then you may also find it in combination with antibiotics like erythromycin or clindamycin. Um, this is beneficial because now you got both drugs, one application helps with compliance from that standpoint. The negative side of benzoyl peroxide is to um, is the fact that it can bleach hair, it can bleach your clothes, and can cause skin and mucous membrane irritation. So make sure they don't get it into like their nares or in the mouth. That will that'll be irritating because the benzoic acid just converts right on over. And then again, we mentioned be careful around the hairline and then the clothes that can have some bleaching effect. So if they're going to apply it, probably you know make sure they have like a ratty T-shirt on or something like that, and so they don't mess up their their good clothes. So similar to benzoic acid is uh, azelaic acid or az azelex. And so this is a uh, dicarboxylic acid here that probably has similar activity to, to uh, benzoyl peroxide, but it also has additional interesting activity of it being able to inhibit conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. I don't know how much we've talked about this already, but DHT or dihydrotestosterone is actually a much more potent androgen than testosterone is. There's an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase that actually converts testosterone to DHT. Um, and so this is what's oftentimes causing much more of the androgenic effects than just testosterone by itself. Okay, um, So one thing to note, by inhibiting that conversion, you can inhibit things like the sebum production and whatnot, some of the hormonal effects that kind of predispose people to developing acne in the first place. And again, think about, too, uh, patients, for instance, with like PCOS, right, who are producing extra androgens, one of the things that they complain of is acne, right? And so by giving them something like this, this may be beneficial because they can prevent conversion of testosterone to DHT and help to, with some of those masculinizing effects and some of the acne-like effects that you can see there locally on the skin. Um, again, mild skin irritation, dryness, again, that's going to be a common uh, side effect for all the medication we're going to be talking about here. And typically we'll do it for about six to eight weeks or so to see how it's going to work, to see how they're going to tolerate it before we decide whether to continue on or uh, dis discontinue it. Um, you can see some hypopigmentation of the skin as well. So that's one thing you definitely want to warn them about. So then we're going to move on to the topical retinoids. So the retinoids are going to be a big class we're going to be talking about here in terms of its management for acne. Um, basically, retinoic acid is the acidic form of vitamin A. And so we don't really know the full mechanism here, but we do know that it helps out with several of the steps, uh, which is why these drugs are pretty good. So it can do things like correcting abnormal follicular keratinization. It can help to reduce P. acne's counts, and it reduces inflammation. So multiple pathogenic steps all being treated with something like tretinoin. Um, and so for a lot of patients, this may be the first thing you put them on if they've already failed things like benzoic acid, right? Or benzoyl peroxide, I should say. So, um, and again, you'll probably find it used in other, in combination with other drugs as well if they have more of an inflammatory sort of process here. Um, also, additionally, this can be useful for wrinkles or dispigmentation. Um, and so uh, this could be another thing you may see used for more aesthetic purposes than just um, for acne specifically, right? So, these drugs are kind of a step up in terms of irritation. So you can see, excuse me, erythema, desquamation, burning, stinging, all of that. So one thing we can try to do as well is to either try to, um, you know, decrease the, the contact time patient has with the skin, or the drug with the skin, or with the use of emollients, right? So I'm thinking about things like Aquaphor, or if you like, you got the really good insurance and get Aqua Five or Aqua Six. You know, I'm just kidding. Um, but you know, things that are tend to be hydrating to the skin can be beneficial here. The other big things too, especially living in Florida here, is the photosensitivity and the risk for sunburn, right? We're in Florida, sun exposed skin, wherever they're applying it, may be at risk for more sunburn. So they need to make sure they're using high SPF sunscreen with actual physical blockers, not just a chemical sunscreen, in order to help prevent those burns from happening, right? The other thing too, um, with pregnant patients, do not monkey around with you just wrote aqua five in your note hopefully it won't come up on the test as that otherwise it'd be a trick question um but the other thing too with pregnant patients you don't want to monkey around with uh fat soluble vitamins a d e and k you don't want to mess with them 
because they're extremely triadogenic. So just like we saw with warfarin being triadogenic, that affects vitamin K. Vitamin A is necessary for developing fetuses too. And so while the topical may not have a ton of effect on a pregnant patient, you wonder about the risk versus benefits. Is, you know, especially with uh, mommy guilt being a huge thing, being a real thing, um, most people will say, well, I know there's a risk, even if it's small, I'm just not going to use it. So we probably wouldn't recommend it in most cases anyway. Again, they can deal with the acne. They can look for other therapies that may not have any sort of interactions for the fetus. Okay. Now, with tretinoin itself, it's actually photolabile, meaning that it actually can degrade in the presence of UV lights like the sun. Um, so we would actually apply this nightly uh, in order to prevent, um, uh, you know, the, the product from actually degrading, right? Um, my wife is actually like really into skincare. And so she's always putting on like sunscreen during the daytime and stuff. And then I'll see her putting on stuff at nighttime. And I'm just like, what, what are you putting on now? Is it like moon cream? Is it like blocking the sun's reflections off the moon? She, she said, tells me to shut up. So I usually do. Um, the other thing to note too is the fact that benzoyl peroxide can inactivate tretinoin. So that means that they can't apply both at the same time. Otherwise, the tretinoin is not going to be working, right? So they may have a schedule where they use something like benzoyl peroxide in the morning and they do their initial washing of the face in the morning and then they, you can use tretinoin after they scrub their face at night and then go to bed, for instance. So again, that can be helpful to separate those out because they don't interact with one another. So there's a few other ones you can run into. Um, the two that I'll mention here mainly for acne is going to be adapalene and then tazeratine. These other two, allotretinone and then uh, bexeratine, are actually end up using uh, used for other types of cancers. So for instance, like Kaposi's sarcoma, which you might see in patients with AIDS um, and like T-cell lymphoma. So I'm not going to focus many much on this, but adapalene and tazeratine are kind of like another step up from something like uh, tretinoin. So um, the benefits here is that they're stable in sunlight and also stable benzoyl peroxide. So it's reasonable if you put the two together there and they tend to be a little less irritating. Um, tazeratine can actually end up being used for some other indications like psoriasis um, and may actually be used with topical steroids in order to help manage that as well. Okay. So topical antibiotics for acne, again, these are going to work specifically where they are placed. Uh, and so we have things like clindamycin that can be used here and erythromycin are probably the most commonly used ones you'll end up seeing there. Again, erythromycin, you don't think about being a good anaerobic um, uh, bug killer, but you know when applying to the skin at very high concentrations relative to what you would get systemically, it does have some activity. With, but you know we have seen some instances of resistance over time, so who knows if this recommendation may change. Um, by the time you guys are out there practicing and maybe teaching future PA students, who knows? Um, benefits with these are they're lacking in systemic side effects, right? So I don't have to worry about C. diff infections while taking clindamycin or diarrhea because of that. Um, because again, they're only working at the face or the, the skin, so you don't have to worry about it getting uh, anywhere else, which is beneficial. Now, what do you do if topical treatment isn't enough, right? So then we have to switch over to consider doing some systemic therapy. And so this is where we can get into our first one here is going to be systemic retinoids. And this is going to include isotretinoin or Accutane. Most people probably heard of this drug before, if not have used it themselves. And so maybe, um, you know, someone could speak to this more so than I can, uh, but it's an interesting thing. So certain drugs carry a big enough risk with them that the FDA feels like there has to be a special program in place to prevent some of these really negative effects from occurring there, right? It's really absolutely right. Lots of potential side effects. So the problem, so whenever the FDA decides a drug has one of these really bad um, side effect profiles that warrants additional um, monitoring and, and registration, they institute what they call a RIMS program. It stands for Risk Evaluation Mitigation Strategy. And so you'll find this for different ones. There's certain psych meds that have RIMS programs. A lot of um, uh, controlled release uh, opioids have this as well. Um, and so this is another one that has a REMS program because of the risk for teratogenicity to uh, a patient should they or to a fetus should the patient get pregnant. Um, Isabel is saying that women have to take a quiz every month and a pregnancy test before getting refills. Absolutely. So this is what happens. It's pretty wild because, again, they, they make sure every step of the way that everyone knows the risk and everyone is prepared for that sort of thing. So basically what it means is. The provider who's prescribing has to be registered with iPledge. iPledge is the REMS program for this one committed to pregnancy prevention. I could probably use the same program for my children. I'm committed to that until they're at least 30 or 40, you know? Um, yeah, there's a lot of paperwork. The uh, So the provider has to be registered, the pharmacy has to be registered, and then the patient has to be registered, right? And so um, basically you would see that um, certain patient education has to be delivered. 
Uh, patient has to acknowledge all of that, fill out the paperwork. They have to make sure they're taking pregnancy tests regularly in order to get the refills that Isabel uh, mentioned. Um, they have to make sure that they are on some form of birth control if it's appropriate, right? Um, or at least educate on birth control and all of that to make sure that um, the patient does not become pregnant while taking this medication because it will either lead to severe birth defects or fetal demise, right? So, yeah, two forms of birth control are, are certainly even better than one. So you could have like, you know, hormonal birth control and then a physical birth control, for instance. Um, so all of those are going to be really important there. Um, and also, also really wild, too, is that they say that, well, guys should actually avoid this as well. So guys have to be registered additionally because they can actually um, have some transference of drug even in the semen. So because of that, they make sure that guys have to be a part of this program as well. So kind of equal opportunity between any patient, to be honest. So, um, again, serious business. I spent five minutes already talking about it. But, again, if you get into Durham, which actually uh, a decent amount of our PAs that graduate from Nova Orlando actually go on to be, um, you know, this may be something you deal with on a regular basis, right? But there's a whole host of other side effects too, right? It's not just the pregnancy thing. Um, you can actually also find that the, and, again, this is a systemic medication. This is a, this is a, a oral dosage form you're taking here. Um, I see, uh, what is the name of the organization program you all have to register in? Uh, that was, the I pledge is the one for this one, but it just depends on, um, you know, usually it's like the drug manufacturer is one that hosts these sort of things here, or it's like to the FDA. But in this case here, um, again, you're taking an oral dosage form, so you're going to see systemic effects happening, right? So you can see retinoid dermatitis, so erythema, pruritus, scaling all over the body, right? It's not going to be just limited to where the acne actually is. A photophobia, right? So they're going to have their eyes are going to be more sensitive to light. They can have photosensitivity. So that's to make sure they're wearing sunscreen. They can have headaches, alopecia, brittle nails, arthralgia. Anywhere where vitamin A is used in the body, this can kind of um, uh, to some degree inhibit that. And so you can see those brittle nails and the hair can be affected and things like that. Also, this is another big one too. Monitoring for signs of developing depression. So if, just like we were talking about with Luke, um, uh, Montelukast earlier, if a patient having uh, has existing depression or if they have, um, uh, you know, any history like psych history, those are going to be kind of higher up on your list of people to be worried about. And, um, you know, people who are, you know, anyone could be at risk for depression. So you have the family members make sure they're looking for signs of the depression, if they notice them withdrawing, or if they start to, you know, make odd comments and things like that, they can clue you in to maybe they need to stop taking the drug be evaluated there. Um, yeah, so I'm saying it seems like the drug uh, with more risks than benefits. Sure, but you know, if you're dealing with severe acne, it's causing a lot of psychological stress and whatnot, or you feel like you're being ostracized by your peer groups, perhaps the benefits outweigh the risk in this sort of situation. So again, everyone's going to have their own personal calculus to deciding whether this is a good drug for them or not. You know, I'm sure everyone's been bullied as a kid before. And if this is a medication that could fix that, then perhaps for them, that would be reasonable to try. Right. So it just depends. Everyone's journey is a little different, obviously. Um, I see usually clears really bad acne usually doesn't come back as bad. Yeah, there you go. So, and again, I've seen cases of people have like really bad cystic acne uh, and it certainly improves, but again, um, you may see that, you know, kind of dry scaly skin as a result of, of that, the ir uh, irritation can be pretty tough. Um, Kyle says, as someone with horrible acne as a teen, I was ready to sell my soul for clear skin. See? Um, yeah, so it's just, uh, it just depends on everyone's own you know, personal values and priorities and all of that. So, again, no judgment for anyone that wants to get rid of acne. It's a, not a fun thing for sure. Um, getting systemic antibiotics. So, again, these are also going to be used for more extensive or more difficult to treat diseases here. Tetracyclines are probably the most common one you're going to see being used here. So, tetracycline, doxycycline or minocycline, either, any of these are fine. Um, these are fairly cheap. You can get them usually on like a free or very cheap drug list at like Walmart or Publix or somewhere like that. Um, and they tend to be pretty effective, right? So other things to watch out for though, right? So you wanna make sure you're not using this in pregnant women, especially second and third trimester. Typically kids less than eight, you don't have to really worry about acne so much, but for teenagers, this is a perfectly reasonable drug for them. All their adult teeth have already come in. Skeletal growth is mostly completed by then. It's, it's reasonable, right? Um, however, be aware of things like chelation pro, uh, issues, right? If they're drinking milk or something like that, it's going to bind that up. Or they're taking multivitamin, iron can bind up the tetracycline. So be aware of that. Other ones you may see used occasionally include Bactrim, azithromycin, ciprofloxacin, but tetracycline tend to be probably the most common you see. There's some other stere uh, other uh, drugs that can be out there. So, for instance, you could use salicylic acid. Um, salicylic acid is, uh, you know, a derivative of 
or is a uh, in the same uh, kind of a congener in the same family as acetylsalicylic acid kind of working like a topical aspirin product. This one's not going to be used as regularly, but it's available over the counter. So some people have, have used this, um, but it's a keratinolytic, right? So it can help, actually help to help degrade that skin there. Um, and it's thought to have some mild anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial activity. But again, not a lot of support for it. I've seen more salicylic acid products being used for things like wart removal and things like that. So you may see that over the counter. Now, interesting too, mentioned and, uh, anti-androgen. So something like spironolactone can actually be used either topically or as an oral product. Um, and again, we mentioned this is a partial androgen agonist, right? So if you had someone who had high testosterone activity, either due to disease or just due to their normal physiology, this can help to reduce that down to some degree. So for instance, like someone like PCOS who's having acne due to hyperandrogenic activity, this could maybe be useful for them, for instance. Um, However, recall that there are those side effects where if people have lo relatively low testosterone activity, this can actually bump them up a degree and they can have the sort of mascul masculinizing sort of effects there and the you know, hair growth and, and whatnot. Um, oral contraceptives are kind of a mixed bag here. We're going to talk about this extensively when we get into um, the ob section next semester. Um, but suffice it to say that oral contraceptives typically include some sort of ethanol estradiol, so like a synthetic estrogen plus a progestin. And so you're going to find that for some people, depending on what their natural body chemistry is and what their natural hormone levels are, that certain contraceptives may be able to help their acne. For some people, it actually makes it worse. And so if you actually look at the list, a full list of different types of birth controls that are out there, it's about three miles long because there's so many different varieties, um, different dosing strategies, different progestins, all sorts of things. So you kind of have to play around with it. And if you work with these types of patients, you may have a, a list of some that you like to use a certain stable of contraceptives that you recommend. And for some of them, they have uh, pro-androgenic activity, which can worsen acne. Some have anti-androgenic activity. It just really depends. And so it's kind of a mixed bag there. But for some people, it is useful. All right. Uh, now, for like large, really inflammatory nodules, things like intralesional steroids can be useful. However, we typically um, try to reserve this to just a few times a year because it can lead to things like skin um, and tissue atrophy. It can lead to adrenal suppression because, again, it is... While not a systemic steroid, it's getting, getting closer to that being actually injected into the area of inflammation. And then occasionally oral corticosteroids can be used here, typically more as like a pulse dose sort of thing to try to get inflammation down under control. And then once things have sort of died down a bit, then you can scale it back there. Usually things like um, prednisone, dexamethasone are most commonly used. So this is a, uh, a table which I think is pretty handy and just illustrates sort of the stepwise approach that you would use to treat different forms of acne, especially as patients uh, tend to progress and, and get worse. You can talk about what type of medications to add on to a regimen. So if I have a test question that comes up and it says, oh, patient's on this, this, and this, what would be a reasonable next step, right? Or if I said the patient comes in and they're pregnant, what would be a reasonable next step, right? Um, again, be aware of which things are contraindicated, be aware of which drugs uh, are kind of more, um, uh, a bigger step up in therapy than others. So if a patient's coming in and they're on oral um, isotretinoin and oral um, minocycline, and you said what to add on next, and they said uh, benzoyl peroxide, well, they've, they've already tried that. That's not working for them, obviously, if they're on that hard, kind of hardcore therapy. But you may consider something like an antiandrogen, for instance, right? So those are kind of the thoughts I want you to have when you're looking through this sort of thing here. But it's a stepwise approach. Start with the easy stuff, start with the lighter stuff, and then gradually progress up. Is anyone going to die of this acne? Well, from the acne itself, no. So you have time. This is not a quick fix sort of thing here. You have time to manage this. Um, again, would the patient like this gone immediately? Absolutely, but that may not be reasonable, right? So again, try things as you get things under control, scale back therapy, because again, it's going to help to limit a lot of skin irritation and problems are going to run into, okay? Anyway, you can kind of go through that. Um, switching gears a little bit, talk about dermatitis sort of as a broad sort of topic here. It kind of helps me launch into talking about the um, the topical steroids more uh, specifically here. Um, but again, you know, dermatitis is pretty common. You hear about eczema quite a lot, especially in kids and, and things like that. Um, but again, it's this kind of chronic inflammation associated with pruritus here. Typically, you know, you can also see that atopic triad was like asthma, eczema, and allergic uh, rhinoconjunctivitis here. But the skin is the major major problem here in terms of dermatitis. And so we're going to see what we can do to help manage this. 
And of course, you're going to see there's certain indications here that may clue you in, um, especially based off of the pride is the, it's there, where, you know, the disease typically pops up, you know, things like that, which I'm not going to get into the diagnosis so much. Um, but our main goals here are try to provide symptomatic relief, try to avoid any triggers if there are some that are identified, whether it be environmental or animal or something like that and then try to prevent future exacerbations. And the other big thing too, we wanna to focus on is treating any secondary skin infections. Because especially with kids, what do they do? If they're itchy and they're scratchy, they, they start scratching everything and then they end up causing um, you know, lesions in the skin, which can lead to infection, which can not be great, right? So now you're treating a skin infection, the cellulitis on top of the eczema they have as well. So for non-farm stuff we can do for kids, you know, we can do things like applying lukewarm baths or using lotions after the bath time, um, keeping fingernails short. I've been having lots of challenges with that with my four-year-old because she really wants her fingernails long. And if we try to cut them, she loses her mind. So sometimes we wait till she's asleep and then we sneak in and do it. It doesn't make any difference. Um, this is another good uh, thing to consider here too, is using a sedating and a histamine to reduce nighttime itching, right? So, for one, you have the thing that um, what kids will do sometimes is that they will kind of wake up kind of half groggily in the middle of the night. They'll be itching and they will then start to scratch and then fall back asleep. And so they'll wake up and have all these scratches on their legs and arms and stuff. And so by using a sedating and a histamine, it one, keeps them asleep for longer. And then two, it will also help to reduce the itchiness, right? Because you're part of the inflammatory uh, process that's causing the itching is the histamine. So by helping to mitigate that, that can be beneficial there. If you can try to distract a child, um, you know, we use balloons around here. Not my kids have eczema, but just talking about distracting children in general, balloons do work pretty well. Uh, and then removing any irritants or allergens, obviously. And again, keep good hydration. So topical corticosteroids here are going to be sort of our gold standard. And then you're going to find that the choice that we're uh, going to go with is really going to depend up um, on severity and the site of disease. Yeah, Amber, uh, I remember doing that too as a kid. I wake up and I'm like, why do my sheets have like blood stains on them? I look at my legs and they have like little scabs and it was not great. Um, I don't think I ever got treated for it either. So, you know, way to go parents. Um, I don't think they watch these anyway, so they won't know. So anyway, so again, where uh, the type of steroid that we use, the concentration, all of that's going to be very dependent on where the inflammation is at, the severity and all of that, right? So generally speaking, we're going to talk about low medium high potency sort of steroids here asthma allergy atopic life there you go yeah uh, ain't easy being wheezy as they say right so what we're going to see is that for low or for areas of thin skin you want to use low potency steroids right because again systemic penetration is going to be much higher for um those areas right so intertriginous areas uh face infants things like that right better for long-term therapy too and again, this may be a thing where you have peaks and valleys in terms of severity. So the more severe it is, you kind of bump up your therapy, higher uh, potency steroids, and then as they improve, then you can scale it back down to see how they do, right? Um, oh, the, the the thing I forgot to mention, I wanted to talk about a story about an infant and the um, uh, the inherent issues that come about with um, uh, dermatologic transfer of medications here. So two stories, one of which, um, one's an actual case I ran into and the other one's kind of a story I saw one time. So there was, um, a, a hospital, there's a, a, a labor and delivery ward, or I guess a post ward, uh, the maternity ward where these women were, um, I think it was out in California. And I think part of the standard, um, thing that they would do is they actually did a urine drug screen on certain babies to see if mom was being, was using drugs during the pregnancy. And so they'd have these little infants here and they were actually all detecting positive for THC, right? THC being the major psycho psychoactive component of marijuana. And so they're like, wait a second, mom's using all this marijuana. They're lighting up joints during pregnancy. That's not good. And so they go and they test the moms. The moms are like, what are you talking about? I don't smoke, I haven't smoked a day of my life. And they test moms with the urine drug screen and the moms are negative, right? So you got these positive babies, you have the negative moms and you're like, well, are they lighting up in the nursery? Like what's going on here? They're actually able to track it down. And again, this goes back into epidemiologic sort of investigations, which we'll talk about later on in EpiBio. But basically by looking to see what was the common pattern amongst all these babies that were testing positive, and it was actually the lotion they were using. It was a type of lotion, I think it was like an Aveeno product or something. But one of the products in there, one of the chemicals, was able to be absorbed through the skin and actually tripped the assay that said this looks like THC, even though it wasn't. So it wasn't like anyone's having any actual drug exposure. It just happened to be this one chemical looks similar enough. It was probably some like hemp based, uh, you know, Aveeno product or something, but it looked enough like THC to the asset show positive. So they were able to switch that out and all of a sudden the kids are, are negative now. So just one degree showing you how thin an infant's skin can be and how much transfer you can actually get. The other story I'll tell you 
there's a young uh, child, probably about 10 months old or so, that was having a lot of diaper rash. And the, the dad actually had um, a history of chronic pain. And so he had um, chronic back pain. He had this like specialty compounded product uh, that was a lotion that he would rub on his back. And it contained just a smorgasbord of various types of neurologic and, and pain relieving drugs. It had like, I think some acetyl salicylic acid in it. It had like ketamine in it and antidepressants like um, amitriptyline in it and all kinds of stuff, right? I don't know how well it worked for his back pain, but what I'll tell you is, is that mom one day had just given the kid a bath, nice warm bath, so the skin's all nice and warm and, and pink. Um, kid was especially irritated in the groin area from the diaper rash, the skin's already nice and inflamed, and then she thinks she's grabbing the uh, the desitin or some kind of diaper rash cream and instead grabs uh, a squirt of this guy's chronic pain meds and then was able to apply it to the groin. Uh, was able to then put a diaper on and said, all right, things are good, right? So you can already see some of the pharmacologic principles we talked about. They apply it to a very thin area of skin. It's in an infant who has thin skin to begin with. The skin is very highly vascular because it's irritated and it's got to have a warm bath. And then now we put an occlusive dressing over top of that with the diaper. So what happens? A couple hours later, mom goes to check in on the kid because the kid's been pretty quiet in the crib. Turns out kid is uh, apneic, non-responsive. The call 911, EMS comes in, they intubate the kid at the scene, bring him on into the hospital, gets him into the ICU. And so we we're like, what the heck's going on here, right? So we had no idea at the time until we figured out that they had exposure. Or the mom was like, well, they're, you know, we were like, what is in the house? What could possibly have caused this sort of thing there? So we're getting the history from the parents. And they're like, oh, yeah, I got this cream. We actually got the label on it and see all the stuff that was in it. And once we saw the academy, we knew that, yeah, that's, a, that's a, certainly an anesthetic. Like that would lead to a picture very similar to this. We were then able to get levels of the blood to measure metabolites of ketamine and sure enough it was there the kid had significant absorption of all of this able to cause these really severe effects eventually was able to work the drugs out of the system was able to be extubated and the kid did fine but again goes to show you gotta be really careful with these areas of thin skin uh, especially if you're applying it to kids especially with infants they have a very large body surface area compared like small areas are basically a large percentage of them um, so even a little bit goes a really long way so you got to be cautious of that sort of stuff there okay uh, someone is asking on the, the CQ board here. It says, sorry if you said this already, but would the systemic antibiotics generally be used for a much longer course for treatment of acne or any oral antibiotic treatment for acne in general? Um, you could use the systemic ones for a decent period of time. So I think like that table is talking about like four to six months or so. So again, if you see that or see someone who's on um, you know scheduled medication like that for a long period, that's perfectly reasonable if it's for that particular indication. So hopefully I, I answered that question, but if not, let me. Okay. So anyway, so point being is you gotta be careful with infants, thin areas of skin, things like that. Especially the face tend to be relatively thin. Um, and so again, you can get good absorption there. So low potency steroids also really good for long-term therapy, right? Medium potency typically used more for like the central part of the body, the limbs, the trunk, things like that. And then for exacerbations, that's when you're gonna peak it up and use either medium to high potency steroids uh, here. And again, after one to two weeks or so, then you'll scale it back down, right? The goal here is to use the lowest concentration uh, most mild steroid as possible because that's going to limit both the local effects and also the systemic effects. So what we're worried about from a local standpoint is going to be things like skin atrophy, you can see local acne, rosacea, and then dermatitis, which is funny because you're using it to treat dermatitis, but it's actually related to the vehicle that it's in. It could be irritating. And then systemically, all the normal stuff we would think about, infections, hyperglycemia, glaucoma, all that stuff, right? And again, the, it's related to potency, the duration of use, the area of the body covered, inclusiveness of the preparation. So if it's an ointment, it's gonna be sticking around for longer than a cream, longer than a lotion. So occlusiveness increases the penetration of that drug. Okay, make sure you know that. All right, so I uh, got a few examples of different charts here. Um, I included one here, here's a website you can go to to look at it as well. Now, uh, this is gonna be a weird one because if you actually look at the list of drugs that are here, here's one example of kind of mild, moderate, potent, very potent. Um, versus um, here's a, a table I also pulled where you can have class one, super potent, potent, upper, mid strength, mid strength, uh, lower mid strength, mild, least uh, potent. Again, I mean, having you guys memorize every single one of these would be a fool's errand, I believe. Um, even though, you know, I do love what a fool believes, but uh, I'm not gonna make you do that, right? I do want you to take away some of the concepts here, right? So these are the things I want you to know, right? 
obviously that you have drugs that are inherently high potency, medium potency, low potency, right? There's a whole scale there, right? Obviously, you know, where it should be, where you should be cautious using um, high potency steroids, right? The more potent it is, remember the more penetration you're gonna get, but remember, you can't use super high potent steroids on areas of really thin skin, the axilla, the groin, the face, right? Other things I want you to kind of key in on, right? You can have various concentrations of the same drug and that will actually boost it up between different potency ranges, right? So for instance, here you can see betamethasone valerate 0.05% is considered to be mild versus something like betamethasone um, valerate 0.1% is considered low mid strength, right? So looking at the concentration can boost it up and cause more effects, which makes sense. because we said, the higher concentration drug you use, the more effects you're gonna get, right? More penetration you're gonna get, that's one thing. The other thing I want you to note as well is that the salt form of the steroid makes a difference as well, okay? What do I mean by that? Let's look at an example here. I'm trying to find a good one that has a different salt form. I think actually hydrocortisone is probably a good one. Right, so if you look here, with the least potent one you can get, and this is available over the counter everywhere basically, is hydrocortisone base. It's just the base hydrocortisone, no salt form uh, they're added. You notice here, various concentrations, all fine over the counter, very mild. Versus if you were to look at something like hydrocortisone, butyrate or valerate, now it's a lower mid strength one, right? I think even there might be some, it's as high as it gets. But just be aware that changing the salt form makes a difference as well. So not all things that start with hydrocortisone are built equally, okay? So again, concepts I want you to know from this. If Professor Sales wants you to know every single one of these, that's her deal. I'm not sure what she's gonna expect out of you, but I'm telling you what I'm expecting out of you for my purposes here. Um, again, if you work in Durham, you're gonna have a stable of drugs that you use constantly. If you do all the time, you're gonna know them like the back of your hand, right? Your job is not to know every single drug out there in the entire world, but it's to be familiar with enough of them so that we can at least do your job to the best of your ability, right? I think they uh, it's estimated that for any given specialty, the stable of drugs that people use most commonly is something like you know 60 to 80 drugs. But you're gonna know hundreds by the time you leave my class. And so again, you're gonna lose some of this stuff, but still, these are the concepts I want you to think about, things I want you to take with you as you go into clinical year, as you get into actual practice, right? So, um, Moving on, what if the steroids are not really effective? What if we're worried about systemic side effects? What if we need something else? And this is where we can get to our topical immunomodulators, right? Um, someone, a wise man once told me as a preceptor of mine, he says, if someone ever says that something works by modulating something, it really just means we don't really know what, what the heck we're talking about. And it's just a way to sound smart. So this may be a way to, to do that, but basically these are called the topical immunomodulators. Um, that can work for rotations too. If someone asks you something, you say, well, I think it modulates the immune system and they, they may be fooled by that uh, a few times. We have two drugs in this category, tacrolimus and then pemacrolimus. You can kind of see how they are in similar naming categories. So they're kind of congeners in the same group there. Um, these can be used to sort of suppress the immune system locally at the side of the skin, basically by inhibiting T cells, mast cells, and keratinocytes from causing inflammation. So, and you'll see these too, if you are familiar with like transplant medicine or for uh, various autoimmune conditions, you may run into systemic tacrolimus and whatnot. These also suppress the immune system systemically when given um, to prevent things like organ rejection, right? If you've had a, like a bone marrow transplant or an organ transplant. So similar activity just being relegated to the skin here. And these are typically second line agents after the topical steroids because we are worried about uh, some of the side effects we're gonna see here, which can include possible cancer risk, this is kind of similar to what we were looking at with uh, you know, the omalizumab suppressing IgE. Again, kind of similar sort of uh, concepts there. And then we don't want to use this in patients with a weakened immune system because there is risk for secondary infections because, again, you still can get some, uh, some absorption, some systemic effects there. The adverse effects typically are going to be worse than your steroids, so burning sensation, and then you have to use high SPF sunscreen um, you know, to make sure that... Uh, they're gonna be very photosensitive. They're gonna be more likely to be sunburned and get rashes and whatnot. So make sure they're gonna be wearing high physical blockers, FPF 9,000 if they can get it. Okay, they don't have SPF 9,000, but FPF 100, something like that. Zinc oxide cream, like that, uh, that'll definitely do it. Um, those are gonna be good to help prevent any kind of secondary uh, sunburns and things like that, okay? Now, you could also consider using oral corticosteroids, but again, this is better for more rapid, quick relief for short courses, maybe like a week or two. And again, similar to what we've seen previously with dexamethasone, prednisone, methylprednisolone, any of those are totally fine, right? 
again, this is something I told you that we're going to see corticosteroids for basically every disease state for every single topic we talk about, you're basically going to run into, um, you're basically going to be running into, uh, you know, steroids everywhere, basically. Okay, let's talk about a few other topical antibiotics there. Of SPF 9000. Oh, I was like, I was like, hashtag what? Like Genji? What is that? I thought it was like some kind of like anime thing or something, but no, hashtag, hashtag Ging. Because you have red hair. Now I get that. Thank you. Um, anyway, so let's talk about a few topical antibiotics you might run into. Uh, so like bacitracin is going to be a good one here. So uh, this is basically um, super common. And basically any topical antibiotic you're going to run into, chances are it's going to contain some degree of bacitracin. And so this is going to be working here. Um, yeah, see, yeah, Richard got what I was going for there um, with the, the 9000 reference. But um, anyway, so with the bacitracin here, it's preventing cell wall synthesis. Again, this is a pretty toxic drug, which is why we don't use it systemically and why I never mentioned it in the past there. But it has pretty broad antimicrobial coverage. It'll get all kinds of things on the skin, staph, strep, uh, anaerobic bugs, tetanus, all kinds of things there. Um, you may not see it used by itself a lot. You may see it in combination with things like neomycin, and or polymixin B. But if you ever hear of like antibiotic ointment by itself, probably be bacitracin. And then you'll hear about double and triple antibiotic ointment. That's gonna be a combination of bacitracin plus one of these two, or it might be all three together. And typically not a lot of adverse effects here. No systemic toxicity, because it doesn't really get absorbed. Uh, but you may see some dermatitis related to, again, either the vehicle or the drug itself, but that's pretty rare. We also have mupiracin or Bactroban. This is actually working um, for uh, MRSA specifically. So if we use this for MRSA, and this is basically to try to prevent um, nasal carriage of MRSA. So if a patient gets admitted to the hospital and they're carrying this in their nares, they're not gonna then accidentally give this to other people in the hospital, to nurses and transfer to other people and whatnot. And so that's where it's used most frequently. And so uh, basically this is working by blocking bacterial tRNA, preventing protein synthesis. So if you have a patient who gets admitted to the hospital, they do a nasal swab and it's positive for MRSA, they'll probably end up getting mupiracin uh, just applied to the nares, you know, right there at the entrance to the nares, and that's gonna be pretty effective to help eliminate that. Um, no real systemic effects, so again, it doesn't get absorbed, but it can cause mucous membrane irritation there at the nose, mainly due to the vehicle that it's in, which contains polyethylene glycol. Polymixin B, as I mentioned, uh, we talked about this being used systemically quite rarely, um, but it's it's a good drug, especially when used topically, because it has really good activity against gram-negative bugs, um, so like Pseudomonas and all of that. But we we said the the downside of it when used uh, systemically is like ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. You got to be really cautious with it used there, or if you're treating someone that has like large open wounds or like big areas of denuded skin that's where you can see better absorption of this drug. So those patients, you would want to be cautious there and watch kidney function, watch out for like neurotoxicity and things like that. Um, so if you imagine you went to like um, a trauma ward or surgical ICU, you know, someone who got out of like I say a motorcycle accident and they have good protection on and they just totally scraped off like, you know, half of their, uh, you know, torso or something like, you know, this would be something you want to be really cautious with because of that absorption that could occur there. Right? So, um, aminoglycosides can also be used occasionally, so things like neomycin and gentamicin. Neomycin is probably more commonly there, and again, we know they work by inhibiting protein synthesis. Um, you can see uh, systemic accumulation, but this is pretty rare for the most part. Um, how, uh, if someone's going to have a reaction to something, it's probably going to be the neomycin. Just like we talked about with the ears, same thing can happen here in terms of uh, effects on the skin. So if, if you're using a triple antibiotic ointment, as bacitracin, polymyxin B, and neomycin. Neomycin is probably going to be the culprit if they end up developing some rash associated with that. All right. I'll uh, we'll talk about a few topical antifungal drugs you can get into. So a few azole antifungals, which we've mentioned before. So this kind of fits into the same categories like fluconazole, like we talked when we covered some of our systemic antifungal drugs. We have a lot of these that are available. You'll see these used especially for like um, vaginal uses as well. Um, and a lot of these are over the counter. So if you get like your monostats and things like that, they usually contain an azole antifungal. So clotrimazole, well, ketoconazole, myconazole, certiconazole, any of these are uh, gonna be acting pretty similar to one another. Um, keep in mind they work by inhibiting fungal P450 in the cell wall. Now when taken orally, this is gonna be a problem because it can cause a lot of drug interactions. Use topically or in the uh, vagina, no big deal. No worries from that. Because again, they don't really get that well systemically absorbed from those areas. Okay. Sometimes 
If patient's having uh, a lot of extra discomfort due to the fungal infection, you can sometimes apply uh, corticosteroids, but this is less common. Uh, and again, treatment may be uh, generally two to three weeks for topical purposes. Um, however, for like vaginal infections, you know, sometimes you can get away with like a single dose uh, being used for those. So it just depends on how you're using it. Another one here we have cyclopyrox or pin lac. This is useful for oncomycoses. Um, basically, it's a nail lacquer that can be applied directly to the nail. Then again, this would be quite occlusive because it once it's dry, it's kind of sticking there for quite some time. Um, however, you're going to find that uh, a lot of patients have trouble sticking with this, and so compliance is a problem. And we're going to find that um, especially. Uh, fungal infections of the extremities, like the toes and the fingers, are quite difficult to treat, and they do require a long time to treat, on the order of like 6 to 12 months in some cases. And so, again, you're going to have patients who will start to use some of these medications, they'll get better, then they don't want to keep using them for the rest of that year, maybe, that you put them on it, and so then they discontinue early, and guess what? Comes right back, okay? But this is one you can see used there, although, you know, again, not the most effective drug you can find out there, but it could be an option. We have some alanamines like naphtaphene and terbinafine or lamisil. Uh, this is basically, again, working on the fungal cell wall to prevent uh, production of ergosterol. Uh, again, limited inter uh, irritation here. These are all topical drugs, so not a lot of systemic absorption. So not a lot of side effects to expect with them, which is beneficial. Um, we can sometimes use things like nystatin for candidal infections. I see actually this used a lot. Um, you know, we talked about nystatin being used for like thrush infections uh, because it doesn't get absorbed systemically when taken orally. They can have you know swish and spit or swish and swallow. I see actually nystatin used quite a bit around um, like G tube sites. Um, so if you have patients like a G tube and they have some degree of like sort of a, a candidal infection or surrounding that, you can actually just apply some nystatin powder and that's able to then help kind of treat that locally, which is pretty beneficial. That's good from that standpoint. Some like tolnaptate can be used as well, um, or you know tufactin, tenactin uh, can be used for more long-term uh, therapy for you know some uh, nail infections and, and athlete's foot and things like that. Uh, so far, topical antivirals go. Not a whole lot here, but we do have drugs like acyclovir or pencyclovir. Uh, we've talked about these before, but remember they're guanine analogs. They get incorporated into viral DNA, but they're chain terminators. So they don't allow any further. Um, nucleotides to be added on there. We're mainly going to be using these for herpes virus, so simplex one and two. Um, so again, if they're getting any kind of like oral labial herpes simplex infection, that can be useful to help treat those cold sores as patients are getting. Um, they help to reduce sort of the duration of symptoms. And again, the earlier they can start therapy, the better it's going to be. That's a general caveat for all antiviral meds. Here's the last one here, um, which is called amiquimod or Aldera. This is actually used for warts uh, caused by uh, virus. And so this is another immunomodulator, but instead of it being an immunosuppressant, like something like um, uh, tacrolimus was, this is a stimulator. Actually, it'll help to stimulate um, uh, TNF, alpha, and interleukins to be produced. And so it basically stimulates your immune system to attack that wart to help to get rid of it. So it could either be external or perianal warts. Um, even some types of skin cancer can be used here as well. Um, but again, because you're stimulating the immune system, you're gonna get a lot of extra irritation. So skin irritation is virtually gonna happen in all patients there, which is notable. And you can see you know, edema, vesicles, erosions. The degree of inflammation though means it's working better. So the more it's irritated, the better it's probably working, which is not super comforting to your patients, but is kind of what it is, right? So that's it for this section here. So we have two more classes. Uh, I think I can probably get through most of the oncology stuff um, next time. And then I think um, for that last session, I'll use whatever time I've left, or I'll use whatever uh, slides I've left to cover for the oncology there, and then we'll do the review. So that last one will be via Zoom. Um, other things I wanted to mention before you go is I graded your prescription assignments. Um, one thing that I did want to mention, if you're writing a script, uh, and so let me bring an example up here. Let's see, we did, um, what was the second drug we did there? It was, oh, it was an allopril. I should know this, I was doing it all last night. Um, so if you go to an allopril and you look at the dosage forms here, Here's the problem, and some of you probably noticed you got like a half a point docked off for this, but you'll see here, okay, it comes as a solution oral, uh, as one milligram per ml, it's fine, 150 ml. So a lot of people put to dispense 150 mLs. And if you're looking at the doses, the kid was getting between like, you know, one to 1 1.2 mLs per dose, right? And they're taking that once daily. So really the kid needed anywhere between 30 and 36 mLs for that whole dose there. 
The problem comes in, if you write down for that whole bottle, is that the insurance company is gonna say, well, why the heck do they need 150 mLs when they only need 36, right? So in general, when you're writing out your scripts, for the quantity, just write whatever the patient needs. They only need 36 mLs, write for 40 if you want. If you wanna give them a few extra mLs, that's perfectly reasonable, but keep it within reason, within 10% is reasonable. Um, so in those cases there, um, if you do write for the too much, typically the patient's not gonna get that full amount. The pharmacy will probably dispense whatever the insurance is gonna cover. Otherwise, they'll probably be a pretty exorbitant price tag associated with that, okay? So that's one thing to note there. Again, we'll figure out from our end, from the pharmacy end, how to dispense it to the patient. If it's something like an antibiotic that has a short duration of stability, so for instance, like, um, you know, amoxicillin might only be good for 10 days or 14 days, we're not gonna be able to get any more use out of that. We're just gonna give them the whole bottle because we're not gonna be able to use it on another patient. However, though, something like this, it comes in a big 150 ml bottle, or I guess that's pretty small still, it's only, um, uh, you know, a couple ounces. Um, you're gonna find here that, um, five ounces to be honest, you're gonna find that um, we can use that for multiple patients because the stability on it's pretty good. So we'd be able to give this to multiple patients. We don't wanna give the whole bottle to, to just one. Um, so little thing to note there, again, only took a half point off, so I don't think it was too egregious, uh, but just to kind of clue you in to make sure that you are just dispensing what the patient needs, okay? But again, keep your dosage forms in mind because a lot of people for that Taflopros prescription, they just put down, put, dispense one bottle. Well, the drug doesn't even come in a bottle, right? So you gotta look at the dosage forms to see how it's dispensed. But otherwise, you're gonna get a call from someone like me. And to be honest, you got 27 months of me. Last thing he needs is another phone call down the line, okay? So uh, if there's any other questions on that, though, certainly you can give me, uh, shoot me an email or something like that. I'm more than happy to discuss if you felt like your grade was unfair or something. But um, anyway, that's it for me today. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Enjoy your uh imaging lecture if that's what you choose to do with your afternoon i see i'm just going to make a mistake just to talk on the phone with you well luckily you won't uh, actually get me on the phone because i teach most of the time i don't do retail anymore because that's uh, a soulless grind that i'm not going to want to deal with anywho yeah retail life is just not for me i'll have to tell you my story about my first time in retail another day i don't know if i told you guys or not but yeah thanks for joining me have a great weekend uh, and I will see you all next time.